Beep boop. All right. We are topic for today is chapter 15, lesson three, dealing with freedom of religion under the First Amendment. As we've already said, this is broken into the two major clauses, the Establishment Clause, Congress shall make no law establishing a state religion, and the Free Exercise Clause, or preventing the free exercise thereof. With both of these, it's worth that same reminder that we were dealing with on freedom of speech, that this is, according to the strict text of the First Amendment, dealing with Congress preventing one from exercising their religion. Although we'll talk about how this is a little bit broader and the prevention of free of free exercise of religion or the creation of an established religion does extend into some private employers as well. The reading that you'll do overnight or over the weekend for chapter 15, lesson four, will explain some of why that is. Um, or at least if you read in between the lines, we'll explain why it is and we'll do a little bit of covering that in class, but why it is that, for example, uh, the First Amendment's freedom of religion protections do, to some extent, apply to employers as well. That said, dealing with this section, I just want to give examples of and talk about these two different major clauses for freedom of religion and how they operate and go over some of the questions that are asked when a free exercise case or when an establishment clause case comes up in court, but then also take a uh, time to look at some real examples to say, as I just said, as we took our reading quiz, that it might be a little bit more complicated than a cut and dry test. So starting off with the establishment clause. The establishment clause is the test that we use when we, or it's the relevant clause of the constitution that we take a look at when a government wants to implement a policy that might be seen as favoring a given religion. It's tempting to fall into a trap here, or sometimes I've seen students fall into a uh, mistaken trap here of assuming that, well, if something has been ruled as a constitutional way in one place for the government to do something that favors a religion, does that mean that they are required to do it in other places? For example, in talking about the case from, what that, from which the lemon test comes, the one listed in our textbook about the government providing, in Pennsylvania, providing textbooks to religious private schools. The government chose to provide textbooks to religious private schools in Pennsylvania and Rhode Island in that case. That does not mean that once it was found that it was constitutional for them to do so, that other states are required to do so. This is about when a government wants to take initiative to implement a policy that might favor a given religion. If the government chooses to implement a policy that would give or could potentially favor a religion, the Lemon Test implemented or uh, first written about in that 1970s case of Lemon versus Kurtzman dealing with Pennsylvania and the state funding uh, government or funding private school textbooks and private school teacher salaries, something we'll get to on the next slide. The court said, well, we have to ask three questions. Number one, is there a non-religious purpose to this law? The government cannot simply create religiously based laws. The government cannot, in the spirit of the Constitution, regulate religion simply as a means of trying to regulate religion. There must be a governmental non-religious purpose to a law that the government tries to implement. In the case of Lemon versus Kurtzman, what is the secular purpose? Well, giving kids science textbooks. We were going to give kids science textbooks anyway if they were enrolled in a public school. There is still the same secular purpose that is served if those are kids that go to a Catholic school or a Jewish school or a whatever other kind of school. Now, again, the government is not compelled to, the government is not forced to provide those books, but it does serve a non-religious non governmental purpose. Item number two. 
not only must there be a non-religious purpose, but the primary effect of the law cannot be to advance or harm a specific religion. So you can't create a policy that is designed to advance a religion or designed to hamper a religion and then throw in some small non-religious purpose. Uh, I really view number two as usually a technicality in there of, and you can't just say, gotcha, also has a non-religious purpose. The primary effect of the law cannot be to advance a religion or harm a religion. Going back to Lemon, well, primary effect of providing kids with science textbooks is kids learn science. Cool. Lemon tests are, or uh, the Lemon case passes the Lemon test so far. Lastly. The policy cannot create a lasting entanglement between governmental institutions and religious institutions. This is where the original Lemon case got split, because the original Lemon case said, okay, we are going to provide the textbooks for religious private schools, and we'll match 15% of the teacher's salaries so that their teachers are well paid. In provided textbooks, the uh, court looked at that and they said, well, that's just the same as you would provide textbooks for public schools. It's a pretty easy and done transaction. That one cuts off. But the idea of 15% of a religious institution's payroll coming from the government creates some problems. After all, those are teachers that are involved in religious instruction. Those are teachers that are going to be involved in religious activities. Having the government pay somebody to take part in religious instruction feels like there is a lasting government entanglement here. What if the government says, starts to tell them how to teach their religion? What if the government starts to uh, incentivize the teaching of certain things? And ultimately the court said, paying for the textbooks, great. Paying for the teachers, we're a little bit uncomfortable with that. And that's why the lemon test is so heavily associated with that case is because it not only divided that case a little bit and clarified, okay, here's what is and is not a permissible use of public funding, but it uh, then creates an enduring test going forward. That said, our test is only somewhat enduring because there are some times where the test seems to be followed and sometimes where the lemon test seems to be questionable in its application. Taking a look at the lemon test in action, if we were to look at these first two, just as I said, this is how they looked at it in the case of Lemon versus Kurtzman. Okay, public funds for private school books, secular purpose, check. Does not advance or harm a religion, check. Uh, does not create a lasting entanglement, check. That one's good to go. Pri public funds for private school workers, secular purpose, check. Doesn't advance or harm a particular religion, check. Does it create a lasting entanglement? And the uh, court got a little bit uh, uncomfortable with that when it came to the case of Lemon versus Kurtzman and said, no, we don't want Pennsylvania to pay 15% of religiously based private school teacher salaries. That said, yesterday when we were doing our Kahoot game or our Kahoot uh, poll, it wasn't a game, it was, oh, it, it, it's a game as much as when at social is a game. Uh, our Kahoot discussion facilitator, there we go. Uh, one of the things that we brought up was the case of a uh, deaf child with an interpreter. In that case, the court system, as we said when we did the review yesterday, did allow, did say that the public funds could of California could be used to pay for a deaf interpreter for a student who needed it without creating a lasting entanglement. To me, this creates a little bit of a, well, is are we using the lemon test here or not? If paying public or paying private school teachers was not okay, but paying an interpreter in a private school is okay. What is the difference here? The justification given by the court in that case is that the interpreter is simply there to serve a function of 
fulfilling out and carrying the Individuals with Disabilities and Education Act and isn't going to be directly involved in any sort of religious instruction. I'm not full. I, I think the court is splitting hairs there, but that, that's what the court does. That's what judges do. They determine how laws should be implemented. I'm not entirely sure I see the difference, but that is how our Supreme Court has ruled it 30 years apart. Then we get to a place where a court has clearly been unclear. Well, what about a public display of the Ten Commandments? Do the Ten Commandments serve a secular purpose? Depends on which of the Ten Commandments we're talking about. Uh, certainly the Ten Commandments are, at their heart, a spiritual document. They are, at their heart, a religious document. Does displaying the Ten Commandments serve a secular, non-religious purpose? Well, I mean, I guess that putting up don't kill has a non-religious purpose. There is a secular purpose to that as well. But courts have been split on whether or not there is truly a secular purpose to these types of displays of religion. They have been split on, is there a secular purpose to the Ten Commandments? Is there a secular purpose to putting in God we trust on money? And really and truly, this is where the lemon test becomes highly subjective. These are the questions that courts ask, but what we need to understand and what we need to ultimately accept is these are different courts, different judges asking the same questions across different times. Sometimes they're going to come up with different answers. If you ask 30 years apart whether or not, and to ask two different people whether or not something serves a secular purpose, you might very well get two different answers. The second clause in the Constitution about uh, religion is the free exercise clause. Congress cannot create any law that prevents you from practicing your exercise freely. Here, this does also extend a little bit to private institutions as well because of the 14th Amendment, which we'll talk about in tonight's reading, even though we've done a little bit with the 14th Amendment already, and things like the Civil Rights Act and other protections that exist to prevent people from discrimination on the basis of their religion. Not only can the government not create a law that prohibits one from exercising their religion freely, but some of those restrictions apply to employers as well. We talked about uh, Samantha Eloff and the Abercrombie case when we were looking at how the court system works. Well, there it was ruled that she did have a right to freely practice her religion of wearing her headscarf, even though Abercrombie and Fitch is not run by the government. When dealing with whether or not the uh, government can prevent one from practicing their religion in a specific way, we don't so much have a list of questions as we have a list of criteria. Number one, the belief in question must be a sincerely held religious belief. Worth noting that our uh, measure there is whether or not the religious belief is sincerely held and valid, not whether or not it's necessarily popular. If the government doesn't have a list of, okay, here are the real religions and here are the fake religions, or here are the ones that are big enough that uh, we recognize them. The government has an evaluation of what they, or it leaves it up to judges, rather, to evaluate what they deem to be a sincerely held religious belief. Even a small minority religious belief, such as religious beliefs held by small Native American tribes, can be held as valid by the uh, government, but they must believe that it is a sincerely held religious belief. Similarly, if a whole bunch of uh, people got together and they said, it's against my religion to pay taxes, well, the government's probably not going to look at that as being a sincerely held belief, but rather a religiously based excuse. Second criteria, the restriction needs to advance a compelling governmental interest, or there must be a need for the government, or when we talk about a little bit tomorrow with, uh, not tomorrow, on Monday, when we talk about uh, private institutions or employers, there must be a need on the part of that employer, an actual need to restrict this kind of behavior. 
the government, for example, has a restriction on the killing of certain types of animals. The government can create a uh, law that prevents you from killing a bald eagle. The government has endangered species laws. The government cannot create a law that prevents you from uh, sacrificing a chicken. That said, if it's part of your religion to sacrifice a bald eagle, I bring that up because this is one that we will uh, eventually take a look at in class. Uh, native tribe with a practice of sacrificing bald eagles in a religious ceremony once every, every once in a while. Is it a sincerely held religious belief? Yes, it is a part of a religion, no matter how small that religion is, or no matter how niche it appears compared to mainstream society. That said, the question is whether or not the government has a compelling purpose in preventing bald eagles from being killed. Yes, they do. It's an endangered species. And not only is it a national symbol, but it is an endangered species. Now. If my religion involved me sacrificing chickens and the government said, no, we don't want you doing that, that's weird. The government doesn't have any ability to step in and deal with a sincerely held religious belief unless there is a fundamental governmental interest such as preservation of government institutions, such as preservation of an endangered species at play. Thirdly, the restriction must then be enforced in as narrow a way as possible with regards to the religious practice that is in question. The government must have any sort of restriction be as permissive as possible to one who is try attempting to practice their religion. Want to take a look at two cases? We mentioned them, we mentioned one of them yesterday and point out how fine the line and how fine the details can be here when dealing with free exercise clause cases. Ultimately, really what my goal here is, is to say, as always, uh, you never know what the exact ruling the courts will come back with is, and it's hard to know exactly what major principles govern our freedom of religion cases. Two different cases, one in South Carolina, one in Oregon. In South Carolina, the religion at play is Seventh-day Adventism, and the uh, worker is a Seventh-day Adventist whose employer says, hey, guess what? We're coming in to work on Saturdays. She says, well, wait a second. Saturday is my religion's holy day. I can't come in to work on Saturday. Her workplace fires her. She has violated company policy by not coming in on Saturday. The company says, you got to work Saturday. She says, sorry, that's a violation of my religion. They cut ties with her. She is unemployed. Now, the question is, is she eligible for unemployment benefits? If she has been discriminated against and fired from her job because she was discriminated against, then yes, she is eligible for unemployment benefits. If she was fired from her job because she refused to come into work, though, well, then that's a different story. So the question is, did her job discriminate against her or is she uh, and did her job force her out because of this? Was she let go or was she fired for insubordination? In the case of, in the Sherbert case, the court looked at this and they said, well, there is religious protection for holidays in South Carolina. A South Carolina employer cannot force you to work Sundays unless they have a valid fundamental reason. I mean, like, you know, the, the Panthers can. Uh, I guess they're North Carolina employer officially, but, you know, two states, one team, keep pounding. Um, the, uh, but a institution cannot force you to work Sundays under South Carolina law. For a Seventh-day Adventist, Saturday is just the equivalent of a Sunday. And what the courts ruled was that unemployment benefits cannot take into account somebody who was discriminated against on the basis of their religion. Cool. We've got a precedent. 
13 years later, we have a court case in the Employment Division versus Smith. It was, and there is a wonderful irony to this, and a drug rehab counselor who was fired for using drugs. Now, he wasn't uh, using recreational drugs. He wasn't uh, using drugs for funsies. It was a Native American worker whose religion included the use of peyote, a hallucinogenic drug, which is usually seen as being a restricted substance. Since he violated drug law, the drug rehab firm that employed him fired him for this. He claims that he has been he is his rights have been violated for uh, practicing his religion. Same question. Is he eligible for unemployment benefits here? Because if you are removed from your job because your religion is incompatible with that job, well, you're definitely going to be eligible for state unemployment benefits. If you're removed from your job because you're caught doing drugs, less likely that you are going to be eligible for that state's uh, unemployment benefits. In the case of Employment Division versus Smith, though, we get a different ruling where the Supreme Court comes back and says, laws can be made to restrict religious practices so long as those laws are in keeping with other types of laws that are regularly made, and religion cannot be used as a reason to circumvent what would otherwise be a valid law. In writing the opinion, Justice Scalia writes that, and we mentioned this a little bit on the last slide, that if we did not have such a restriction, then people would use this as, well, speeding is, uh, <laughs> traffic laws are against my religion, or paying taxes are against my religion that even though this was viewed as a sincerely held religious belief by the courts, that there is enough of a strong interest in preventing drug use and allowing workplaces to fire somebody for drug use that uh, in the case of Employment Division versus Smith, the First Amendment was not seen as an absolute protection. Um, Mr. Carter. Ellie. Can you go over again, like the the difference between like if she's eligible or if he's eligible for um, um she was and he was not, and the interpretation that the court gave in this was that with the Sherbert case, with the South Carolina case, there was a law on the books that would normally protect most religions by saying you can't be forced to come into work on a Sunday. Well, if we just read this as a small exception to that law of shouldn't be forced to come into work on a Saturday, if that is your religious held belief, um, that that law can be reinterpreted in that way. You can use the First Amendment to reinterpret and uh, reconfigure how laws are implemented, but not in the case of Employment Division versus Smith to completely uh, negate or override a valid existing law. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. <laughs> Excellent. Any other questions? Well, we'll stop the recording so that we can get to the good stuff and get to the good questions. Maybe. There's the stop recording button. Bye, Internet.